Welcome everyone. I'm Kristen Uhlenbach. I'm with the U.S. Clavar Project Office. Thank you for joining us today. Looks like we have a nice attendance tuning in right now. Um, I'm glad that you've tuned in. Um, this is going to be the first half um, of a two-part series that is based on our most recent edition of Variations, which we are calling A Tale of Two Blobs. I know that Mike Patterson, who is the director of the U.S. Clever Project Office, and I were both excited to kind of see this edition come together and, and all the contributors who, who came together to put together an article. Um, the Tale of Two Blobs edition is actually a collection of articles from the scientific community, and it's discussing two different anomalous sea surface temperature events. Um, that both really caught the community's attention, but also uh, media's attention. Um, what we're going to hear from today is the first part, which is the worm blob of the North Pacific took place mostly between 2013 and 15. We're going to see doesn't necessarily hold its shape through that time. Um, so we're going to hear about that today, and, and also the terminology of what people are calling it as a marine heat wave as well. And then on Friday, I um, hope you can tune back in for the second part in this series where we're going to talk about the cold blob in the North Atlantic. So before I introduce the speakers, I want to just go through a few logistics. Um, this webinar is being recorded, and I'll make an archived version available online after today. Everyone who is joining um, is currently on mute, um, so you'll remain on mute throughout the presentations. And we'll take you off mute um, when it's Q&A and if you have a question. To ask questions, you have two options. Um, one is you can type them into the chat function, and which I'll monitor throughout. And if they're technical, I'll try to get them answered. If they're substantive for the speaker, we'll, we'll hold those to the end. Um, and then during Q&A, you can also raise your hand. Um, if you raise your hand, you need to make sure that your audio is properly connected. I'll take you off mute. I'll introduce you, and you can ask your question then of the speaker. We're going to have three presentations. Each will last about 12 to 13 minutes. Um, we're going to take all the questions at the end. We're kind of going to do this like a panel. And we'll have hopefully 15 to 20 minutes at the end to do all Q&A with all three panelists. Um, if you do have a clarification question, like a really short, did you mean X, um, you can ask that when the presenter is over. I'll, I'll allow for a minute or two of that. Um, but we really want to hold the substantive questions um, to the end. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the only other thing I do want to say is that um, thank you, and, and thank you for participating. And we will get started. Um, so I'd like to introduce the first of all three speakers. Um, Dylan Amaya is from Scripps, and he's going to be giving us a presentation talking about the evolution of known atmospheric forcing mechanisms behind the warm anomalies seen in the North Pacific. Our next pre presentation is going to be by Manu DiLorenzo from Georgia Tech, and he's looking at the climate interpretation of the North Pacific marine heat wave. And then the final presenter today is Samantha Sadecki from the University of Washington, and she's really going to focus in on more of the biogeochemistry and the ecosystem impact. So thank you all for tuning in. Um, Dylan, I'm going to hand it off to you and, and go ahead and kick us off. Awesome. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming out today. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm Dylan. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, uh, Nick Bond at the University of Washington, uh, my advisor, Art Miller, who's uh, here at Scripps, and also a friend and colleague of mine at JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, Mike DeFlorio. So thank you guys for your contribution to this. Uh, and I'm just going to jump right into it um, in the interest of time here. So kind of the first thing that we think about when we think of these marine heat waves in the North Pacific that's been around for the last three years or so is kind of this, this structure, right, the blob. Um, however, one of the big points I kind of want to point out today is that the blob is really only one part of a much larger story. If we think of this marine heat wave as a continuum of events, it's only, what I'm going to argue, it's only about one-third of, of, of this larger events that we've experienced. Um, these North Pacific warm anomalies have evolved. They've evolved in time. They've evolved in space and uh, between three centers of action um, according to the different atmospheric forcing mechanisms that are, that are driving them. So uh, we're going to talk about those transitions as best as we understand them today. Um, and we're going to talk about the three centers of action. So there's going to be the blob, uh, what we're calling the arc pattern, uh, and this Baja warming. And we'll talk about um, the different features that, uh, that describe each of these as we continue on. Um, and we're not really used to thinking about um, uh, North Pacific SST anomalies as being like the SST anomalies in the Pacific that we, 
that we are most concerned about here in North America. Normally we're thinking about things like El Nino, right? And we had this massive Godzilla El Nino this past winter. And, of course, with names like The Blob and El Nino, the scientific community and, and the media loved this, right? So here's my obligatory 1950s blob reference. Uh, and, of course, the media picked up on this, right? So this, this constant the battle between Godzilla, El Nino, and the blob, uh, both vying for our attention. So just to keep in the spirit of things, I am going to assign movie monsters to uh, the arc pattern and the Baja warming. So I'm going to go ahead and assign uh, uh, Mothra to arc pattern and Ibira to uh, Baja warming. And uh, I can't hear any of, you, any of you, so I'm going to assume that somebody chuckled at that. Uh, and I'm just going to power, power through here. And, yeah, they're all, they're all vying for our attention, and they're all kind of uh, battling with this mega drought for our, for our concern here in California. So here's kind of the timeline of events that I want to follow today. It all kind of starts with the establishment of this ridiculously resilient ridge, high-pressure ridge off the northwest coast of North America, and also the establishment of what we're calling the Gulf of Alaska warming. So this is the same thing as the blob. I'm going to use that terminology today interchangeably with the blob, um, and that's just kind of to orient ourselves um, geographically relative to these other two uh, centers of action. Um, so here it is. Here's the blob, right? This is first described by uh, Bond et al. in 2015. And the first thing I want to focus on is this time series. It's, uh, it's for this point. I don't know if you guys can see, get the marker here. You guys can see this blue star right here. That's, this is a point time series. And you can see that it's a warming, a record warming in the Northeast Pacific um, for the last, at least the last 30 years. And depending on what data set you use, um, it's a record warming for the last century. Uh, so the blob in the Northeast Pacific and in the Gulf of Alaska um, is truly an extreme event, right? And in a lot of ways, this event is so extreme because its forcing mechanism, which turns out to be this high-pressure ridge that you see here, was so extremely stubborn. It was so extremely persistent. Um, and uh, let's, let's talk about this ridge for a second because it kind of had its way with the weather in the, in the, in the winter of 2013-2014. Um, it consistently deflected wintertime storms north of California, which helped intensify those me that mega drought, pushed ARs more to the northwest Pacific, ARs being atmospheric rivers. Um, uh, it, it, it led to jet stream perturbations uh, downstream. Uh, Hartman 2015 said that it might have contributed to the historically cold winter that North America experienced in 2013 and 2014. And, of course, it was indicated as the main forcing mechanism of the blob um, in that winter as well as from Bond at all. So let's talk about this last point here, this last bullet point. Um, this is going to be part of the uh, mixed layer heat budget that Bond et al. Uh, performed for the a volume of water in the Gulf of Alaska. And uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through each one of these time series or even the entire heat budget. Uh, I'm just going to kind of uh, give you the cliff notes of this. And uh, basically, the, the major finding was that um, uh, the atmosphere during this time just did not impart uh, as much energy into the ocean as it did for winter, as, as normal, as normal uh, for that time of year for wintertime mixing processes. Basically, this high ridge, uh, this high pressure ridge, it's anomalous high pressure, so there's anomalously anticyclonic flow around this uh, pressure center. Um, so in the Gulf of Alaska region, that would oppose the climatological background westerly. So you weaken the mean flow, um, you reduce the amount of energy being put into the atmosphere or excuse me, being put into the ocean for wintertime mixing processes. Um, the mix, mixed layer does not deepen as much from the beginning of the winter to the, uh, the end of the winter. There's less entrainment of cold water from below um, at, the, at the base of the mixed layer. There's less advection of cold water from ecman transport at higher latitudes. Um, so basically, uh, the main point was that the Gulf of Alaska warming isn't really the result of active forces warming the water. It's actually just a result of lack of seasonal cooling. Uh, and that really is what established this marine heat wave as such an extreme event because uh, there was such an extreme reduction in the amount of energy being put into the ocean for those wintertime mixing processes. Um, so what, what, what kept this blob um, so persistent uh, past the ridge's lifetime? The ridge didn't last for as long as the blob, the blob lived. The ridge maybe lasted four or five months, which made it so resilient, and it was kind of on and off. Um, but the blob lived for much longer than that, uh, and we can kind of see maybe why that is. Um, this is a uh, Argo temperature profile for the same volume of water that uh, um, Bond et al. chose. Uh, and overlaid on that is the seasonal cycle of the mixed layer in for, uh, for, for the mixed layer as derived by Argo data in that same volume. And the shading here is going to be temperature as well. And you can see in the winter of 2013-2014, you can see the establishment of the blob, right? 
Uh, and as the, the mixed layer deepens climatologically, those temperature anomalies are mixed downward. And then in the spring and the summer, uh, when the mixed layer shoals again and becomes much shallower, those temperature anomalies are trapped below the mixed layer in that summer. Um, but as the mixed layer again deepens in the following winter, those temperature anomalies are mixed back upward and you start to get a reemergence or a kind of a sequel of the blob in that following winter and early spring. So there's definitely some thermal inertia in the system up here in this, in this particular region of the North Pacific, uh, which helps contribute to uh, some of that persistence of the blob from one season to the next. So moving along our timeline here, um, at the end of uh, 2013 and going into 2014, um, the blob had been established, the ridge had been established, and this marine heat wave was kind of in full force, but it was all offshore. Um, the coastal communities and coastal ecosystems had not yet felt the, the extremeness of this particular event. Um, and at the beginning of 2014, our attention returned to the tropics because most of our climate models were predicting a really strong El Nino, um, or at least a significant El Nino in the following winter. Um, but as we know, that kind of fizzled out, right? So uh, we never quite uh, got above even half a degree uh, warming in the equatorial strip for too long. Uh, we, were, we were just mildly warm. So that, that El Nino turned into a kind of a weak event, even though we thought it might be strong. Um, but there's some, some recent literature, um, a recent study by Manu actually and Nate Mantua, which they're going to talk about a little bit later, indicated that this warming um, throughout 2015, or excuse me, 2014, was possibly enough to drive a PNA pattern, a Pacific North America pattern, where you anonymously deepen the Aleutian Low sitting over the, um, the Gulf of Alaska. And you can kind of see that in this North Pacific Index. This is kind of a measure of, uh, of uh, Aleutian Low variability. And you can see the ridge. So when this is positive, you have a ridge or high pressure in the Gulf of Alaska. You can see the ridiculously resilient ridge here. And then throughout 2014, as the equatorial strip is at least mildly warm, you start to see this downward trend um, in Aleutian low variability. It gets deeper and deeper and deeper the more you go into 2014, and you get uh, a pretty deep Aleutian low by the end of 2014 and into 2015. Um, and this led to uh, a, a breakdown of the ridge, and it allowed these North Pacific anomalies to evolve. They changed according to the atmospheric circulation. Um, and this led to something else entirely. It led, led, uh, it led to uh, this arc pattern is what we're going to call it. Um, so this, this arc pattern, which we call it that because it kind of looks like this horseshoe shape of sea surface temperature anomalies kind of encompassing this low pressure center. Uh, and it looks slightly PDO-like, right? It has some PDO characteristics. It's not quite um, as PDO-y as, uh, as we might see a little bit later, but it is still a record warming, right? It's this, you can't really see the star. But it's here in the California current system. You can see that in the California current system, this was a record 30-year warming as well. Um, and this kind of marked the arrival of the blob, quote unquote, arrival of the blob on shore. Uh, this is really when the coastal ecosystems and communities really, really felt the impacts of this marine heat wave. Um, and there's, there's not a whole lot of literature out there right now explaining exactly, quanti quantitatively explaining um, why we get all this. I mean, it looks PDO-like. Um, and, you know, like looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, so probably is a duck kind of thing. Um, so because it has some pedialyte like characteristics, it likely is the result of these kind of surface heat fluxes that we would expect around the edges of this uh, Aleutian low uh, variability. Um, but there was a nice study by Zaba and Rednick uh, that just came out recently. They used an impressive uh, data set of spray gliders um, and, and show that in the California current system within about 400 kilometers of the coastline, so not too far out, um, there was a uh, warming is, is exacerbated because of uh, uh, reduction in, uh, in seasonal mixing and seasonal upwelling, um, at least along the coastline. So I think Samantha is going to do a much better job um, uh, than I'm doing, at least, of uh, explaining the coastal dynamics uh, during her presentation. Um, so I'll give her that little plug there. So zoom in here through uh, the Baja warming. Um, so into, uh, let's see here. So as we move into 2015, our models were once again um, predicting a big El Nino, right? And this one actually panned out. It actually became this Godzilla El Nino that we thought it would be. But in, the, in early 2015, the equatorial strip was still warm enough to still push that PNA, that negative, uh, excuse me, positive PNA, and a deep dilution low in the, uh, the North Pacific. Uh, but for whatever reason, and I, I don't know the answer to this, um, it could just be internal variability, the Aleutian low, or these negative sea level pressure anomalies, dipped further south. They dipped into the subtropics, into the deep tropics, uh, where the zonal wind here would be opposing the black background um, climatological trade winds in the subtropics here. Uh, and this shifted sea, uh, sea, um, 
sea surface temperature anomalies um, southward down into the tropics. And this is different than the arc pattern because the arc pattern before had more of a zonally, um, zonally oriented warm tongue here, uh, more centered around 30 degrees north, whereas the, the Baja warming is more of a northeast-southwest wind tilt um, centered on this Baja region. And if you look at the star again, this is again a 30-year record warming off the coast of Baja, um, Baja, Mexico. Um, so what's driving the dynamics of this? Why, why is this any dynamically different than the arc pattern? Well, uh, this looks something like a Pacific Meridional Node. And um, for those that may not be familiar with the Pacific Meridional Node, it's kind of a, um, a thermodynamically coupled interaction between surface air temperature, or excuse me, surface wind and sea surface temperatures, um, where sea surface temperature anomalies can propagate southwestward from the subtropics off the coast of Baja down to the equator, and they can actually enhance SST variants on the equatorial strip and possibly even lead to El Ninos. And I think Monty's going to um, talk about this in detail a little bit more. But again, looks like a duck, quacks like a duck. So this Baja warming likely has a lot to do with some similar dynamics that we would associate with the PMN. So things like air-sea interactions, such as wind evaporation SST feedback, and low-level, um, low-cloud SST feedback are likely important in this uh, broad scale of nature. Um, so finally here on our timeline, Godzilla and El Nino uh, arrived. Um, it was big. It was uh, historic. It was a bit of a dud when it comes to uh, rainfall in Southern California. However, it did generate a significant deepening of the Aleutian Low, uh, and that's kind of where we sit today. Uh, this is the first three months of 2016. You can see a much more defined, um, much deeper Aleutian Low over the Gulf of Alaska region. You can see a much cleaner PDO-like pattern. Um, but you also notice that the sea surface temperature anomalies throughout the Northeast Pacific have weakened. They're about half as strong as they were um, at the height of this marine heat wave. So it looks like the marine heat wave as a total is, um, has weakened um, and uh, may be on its way out. Um, however, uh, based on the reemergence mechanism that we discussed a little bit earlier, we might naturally ask the question, do we get a sequel? Uh, and we all kind of know that sequels are always worse than the original, so we don't really want a sequel in this sense. Um, however, uh, most of our models, at this time at least, are predicting La Nina-like conditions in the following winter. And a La Nina is going to drive uh, an opposite sign PNA. It'll actually drive a ridge. Um, it, often it'll drive a ridge over the north, uh, northeast Pacific. And to the degree that the ridiculously resilient ridge was the driving mechanism behind the blob, uh, we might see some kind of a resurgence if uh, that comes to fruition. So I think I'm, I may be over time here, but um, if we have any clarific clarification questions, I'm happy to take them. Thanks, Dylan. <laughs> you had me chuckling, so <laughs> I'm sure others as well. Yeah, we're running a little okay. tight on time, so we're going to go right into Manu's presentation. So if you have any questions for Dylan, jot them down. We're going to do a panel Q&A once everyone's done. Um, thanks, Dylan. That was a great presentation. And we'll get Manu's first slide up here. Okay, can you guys all hear me? Yes, yeah. Yes, okay. you sound great. Thanks, Manu. Go ahead. I will continue and try to provide uh, some kind of a climate interpretation of these of this marine heat wave between 2013 and 15, and I'll pick up from the long presentation, uh, looking at these two patterns of winter anomaly uh, here, the 2014 that had this kind of Gulf of Alaska pattern here in the center, and then the winter, uh, January, February, March of 2015 that had this kind of more coastal or let's call it arc pattern here along California. And these two patterns are distinct. And the question that I would like to address in this short presentation is, what are the large scale climate mechanism linking these two patterns? And throughout the, the discussions that we had in the scientific community, it was clear that ocean advection uh, wasn't necessarily the important link between these two evolutions that we see in these pictures, but that the atmosphere was actually the, the probable link. And so I'm going to talk about that. And to understand that, first, I'm going to note that these type of patterns of sea surface temperature anomalies are not unknown in the North Pacific. And in fact, in the winter of 2014, uh, it looked a little bit like the North Pacific gyro oscillation uh, type of variability pattern, whether in the winter of 2015 it had more of a PDO-like expression. Now, uh, this is, uh, we can quantify this a little bit better by looking actually at the first uh, dominant modes or EOFs of sea surface temperature in the winter in this particular domain. And so what I'm showing you here is an index of this kind of uh, Gulf of Alaska warming pattern that Dylan showed in his presentation, which is shown here in blue. And then on top of that is the second principal component 
of the wintertime sea surface temperature variability showing correlations of 0.95 and capturing this big peak here. And so this is somehow, we can call this an NPGO-like type variability. We can do the same exercise for the PDO type pattern that we saw in the winter of 2015. And so here again, we have an index of this arc as a C anomaly, uh, similar to what Dylan had shown before, showing this peak in 2015. And then again, the first principal component of SSC tracks that pretty well. So given that this is uh, what's happening here, the interesting part is that these two particular patterns, even though statistically independent of lag zero, uh, we actually find that they're not independent. And so what I'm showing you here is a cross-correlation function between PC2 and PC1, or if you like the NPGO-like expression and the PDO-like expression uh, as a function of time. So this is the lag in years and this is the correlation. And what's interesting here is that when we look at PC2, we find that there's a significant correlation of 0.6 when PC2, that is this pattern here, leads by one year uh, this pattern over here. And, th and this particular cross-correlation is computed over the last, uh, what is it, from 1980 to present. And, uh, and so this kind of tells us that statistically, these two patterns are not independent. And so the question is, what mechanisms link these two type evolution of these kind of heat waves in the North Pacific. Now to do that, um, well, so the question then, why does winter NPGO-like variability lead to a PDO-like response the following winter? Now to do this, I'm gonna focus first on this type of uh, Gulf of Alaska pattern. This is a sea anomaly and look at the characteristic uh, anomalous forcing of the atmosphere that happens uh, during those expression of SSC. And so what I'm showing you here is the sea level pressure anomaly that are characteristic of that uh, particular Gulf of Alaska or NPGO-like type variability. And so typically we have a dipole structure uh, that uh, in the literature sometimes is described as the North Pacific Oscillation. And this particular anomaly uh, really uh, just to to think of it physically, uh, one can think that this ca captures, in a sense, a change in the strength of the mean atmospheric circulation, which I kind of superimpose here uh, as the mean Aleutian low as the mean North Pacific high. And so you can see that this dipole more or less, you know, uh, tracks changes in the strength. And when this happens, essentially, if we plot the wind anomalies that go along with this pattern, we find these uh, vectors here that are the wind anomaly. And in particular, in the subtropics, where the ocean and the atmosphere begin to be more tightly coupled, uh, these anomalies tend to weaken the trade winds. And this weakening the trade winds in this particular region here produces an SST anomaly. Uh, and, and this SST anomaly can actually further reduce the speed of the, of the of the trade winds through this uh, well-established mechanism, which is the uh, um, winds evaporation sea surface temperature feedback, or WES, uh, which uh, Shang Ping Si, I think he's online, is, uh, is, has introduced. And the interesting part, once you have these anomalies, typically uh, this, this feedback mechanism produces this, this coupled anomaly that tends to grow, and as it grows, it also moves uh, towards the uh, central uh, tropical Pacific in this region. And once it reaches the equator, this sea surface temperature anomaly, of course, uh, as the, as very important. And, and, and I wanted to point out this type of propagation here is often also referred to as meridional modes. Uh, and these are some authors that have discussed this type of dynamics in the context of the Pacific. And as, as I said, once this SST anomaly reaches the equator, of course it has the ability to favor the development of ENSO because it can weaken the Walker cell and essentially activate all the positive feedbacks that grow, uh, you know, an El Nino or ENSO type variability. And so su subsequent to this type of propagation, which happens let's say in the spring, uh, the following summer and fall, you can have the development of an El Nino. And after you have the development of El Nino, of course, you also rearrange uh, the convection cells in the tropics. Uh, and this is typically, you get a higher sea level pressure here and a lower sea level pressure. And this type of rearrangement on convection can excite uh, teleconnection or Rossby waves in the upper atmosphere that bring the signal back into the extratropics. And what you're seeing here now is the typical sea level pressure anomaly in the following winter. Uh, you can see the, here again at the surface you have the high pressure and here the low pressure. And this low pressure really projects onto uh, a weakening or is, if you like in this case an intensification of the Aleutian low, uh, which ultimately drives uh, this type of SST pattern, which is the one that we saw in the winter of 2015, which is really the PDO or the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. So in this type of propagation, we go from uh, an NPGO-like SST anomaly to an ENSO-like response in the tropics to a PDO-like 
uh, response the following year. And so the idea is that this particular dynamics where you have an NPGO-like variability, meridional modes, ENSO-like variability, and then PDO-like variability is a mechanism to produce a multi-year persistence of warm anomalies in the North Pacific. Now, if we compare these particular patterns to the actual patterns of the evolution of the warm blob, which I'm plotting now here on top, these are the actual pattern. Uh, and so we have the strong anomaly in 2014, we have a strong anomaly in 2015, but the ENSO-like expression in the fall of 2015 didn't seem quite strong. In fact, we, we talked about a, fall, a failed ENSO. And so the question is, uh, for this particular event of this warm event here, was ENSO really important in persisting you know, the warm blob you know, in the following winter? And so to address that question, uh, we, uh, essentially the question was, was the ENSO teleconnection important in persisting and intensifying the 2015 anomaly? What we did is uh, we first looked at an index of the SST anomaly, which uh, I think uh, Dylan referred to as the ARC SST index, and this shows here the time evolution from 1980 to 2015, and this is the peak in the winter. And then we used uh, 50 simulations with the climate model to try to extract a fraction of this North Pacific atmospheric forcing that drove this anomaly that actually originated in the tropics. And so the idea is that we essentially take a, a general circulation model of the atmosphere and we prescribe the SST in the tropical strip and then allow for the SST to adjust everywhere else around the globe. And then essentially by producing an ensemble of this run, we can look at the ensemble mean to essentially uh, extract what variability of the extratropical SST is really connected to tropical forcing. And once these experiments were conducted, uh, we, here's the reconstruction of the climate model. And what we find is that overall, the climate model reconstruction does pretty well in tracking the variability of, of this particular pattern of SST anomaly. And that's not surprising because we know that these type of teleconnections or PNA-like teleconnections are always active and have been recorded in the past. But we also find that this particular year, the 2015, was actually not one of the weakest years, but actually contributed to almost about half of the size of the anomaly that we saw in the winter of 2015. So in other words, without this teleconnection, probably the winter of 2015 would not have had the same amplitude anomaly as the one that we saw. So it's likely that this teleconnection actually was important in persisting and reamplifying the warm blob the following year in 2015. So the result here would be that ENSO teleconnections accounts for about 50% of the SST anomaly in the winter of 2015. So to summarize then, uh, um, the, the, well, the next question that I want to address is, are these type of climate events becoming more frequent? And of course, one of the initiator of this, of this warm blob in the first place was this kind of NPGO-like expression. And there was a paper that came out uh, I think in 2014 by Wang and, and then a, a following paper by Ewan in 2015, who actually looked at the coupling strength between this type of variability. Uh, they were looking at the drought in the atmosphere, but it, so they were looking at atmospheric variability of this pattern, but it's kind of the same. They were looking at the connection with ENSO, and they found that there was, according to the observations, there was a strengthening in the coupling between the extratropics and the tropics and this is a, is a measure of that coupling in terms of correlation uh, that they produced in that paper, showing that perhaps there's a trend in this uh, intensification of this coupling. And so they asked in that paper whether this particular trend was actually associated with uh, you know, natural variability or if it was related to some kind of greenhouse forcing. And so they ran uh, some simulations, I, I believe, with the CSM model, the Community Earth System model, and this is the result that they, they showed in their paper where the blue line here is the natural variability and the red line is the, is the greenhouse experiments, greenhouse forcing experiments, suggesting that perhaps this intensification of coupling between uh, these kind of, let's, talk, let's say, meridional modes is really connected to some kind of greenhouse forcing. So this is a suggestion. The question is what would be a mechanism? And one possibility uh, of a mechanism that we, we kind of put forward is that the thermodynamic coupling between the ocean and atmosphere is getting stronger which means that once you activate a meridional mode, at the end of the growth of this mode, the SST anomaly that the mode produces is larger on average, and being larger means that it has a higher likelihood to really uh, you know, trigger an ENSO-like response. And if that were the case, that, that could account for an intensification of the coupling between the two. 
And um, so the question then, if this is true, then is the variance of the North Pacific climate also increasing? And so to answer that question, we actually looked at the community air system model, uh, which has 30 member ensembles here. And the, these kind of model simulations are forced from 1920 to 2100 with the RCP 8.5 greenhouse gas scenario. And so let's look at this uh, CSM large ensemble. And what we've, we're plotting in this figure, we have in the first panel here, we have the, the second EOF of North Pacific winter SST. And you can, see that, you can see that this second EOF actually captures some kind of NPGO-like or Gulf of Alaska pattern. And here you have the first UF of the winter SSC, which captures, again, the PDO-like, uh, uh, you know, or if you like, the ARC pattern. So this particular model actually seems to capture really well the two dominant modes of winter SSC variability in the North Pacific. And in fact, if you correlate these patterns with the observed, you find correlations in excess of 0.9 that are significant. So then we can use these indices in, uh, of the EOF2 and EOF1 as essentially indicators of this kind of Gulf of Alaska pattern and arc pattern that were important in the evolution of the warm blob and ask if the variance of these patterns is increasing. And so this plot here shows essentially how the variance is changing through time for the NPGO-like pattern or the PC2 in the model and the PDO-like pattern. And so what you're seeing here is essentially for Every single ensemble, we compute a running variance, in this case, a 20-year running variance. And then at the end, we take the ensemble mean of the, all these running variances, which are reported here in blue. And you can see that in both, for both the second PC and the first PC, we have a significant amount uh, of increase in the variance of these modes. And so, so the result here would be that this, this large ensemble of the CSM predicts an intensification of the Gulf of Alaska pattern by the 21st century. Um, so going back to, to our schematic here, uh, we can summarize you know, our, an interpretation or an hypothesis for uh, the evolution of the warm blob and for these kind of marine multi-year persistence of marine heat waves. And so again, you know, uh, as we said before, we had initially an atmospheric ridge that generated the initial kind of warm blob in this uh, NPGO-like or Gulf of Alaska pattern. Uh, after that, uh, we had an ENSO response in the tropics that produced teleconnections, and this reinforces and adds persistence to the winter anomalies in the following years. We also discussed the possibility that the thermodynamic coupling that is important in, in essentially activating and, and supporting these meridional modes may amplify under greenhouse forcing, and this is, again, an hypothesis that needs to be further tested. And, and, but if this is true, if these teleconnections are true, then what we would expect is that uh, also the connection or the coupling between this NPGO-like variability and the PDO-like variability in the following winter would also increase. And, and so what we're showing here, in fact, is a running correlation uh, between the PC2 at year zero correlated with the PC1 the following year. And so we looked at, our analysis was looking at data, you know, from 1980 to present where the correlations were 0.6. And you can see if you go backward in time, you know, as much as you can with the available observations, you can see that there's actually a trend in this uh, correlation, uh, you know, suggesting that perhaps there is really an, inc an intensification in this coupling of these two modes, which could be explained by an intensification of these meridional modes and uh, essentially the North Pacific variance. Uh, so this is really all I have to say, and if you, uh, more of these dynamics are explained in a paper that uh, is coming out next month uh, on this North Pacific marine heat wave, and the theoretical, or if you like, the, the concept idea of how ENSO and these meridional modes are important in these kind of low-frequency variations of the North Pacific is explained in an earlier GRL paper uh, that we submitted last year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manu. Um, we'll hold all questions again to the end for the panel Q&A, um, but that was a great presentation. Um, let's move on to Samantha. Are you there? Let's test your audio. Yes, I'm here. Can you guys hear me okay? okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. So um, I'm going to not talk about the, um, thanks for that, both great presentations before uh, this one about the dynamics of, um, of the blob and the marine heat waves in the North Pacific. Um, I'm going to talk about specifically um, the impacts on the coastal communities and the biogeochemistry of the North Pacific. And so um, I'd like to also acknowledge my co-authors on this work, um, which you can read the full article in, this, uh, in the newsletter. 
Um, okay, so um, this is just to set the stage, which I actually don't really think I need to do now because there's been so much, there's been so much um, uh, done in these prior two talks. But temperature that light anomalies that have been talked about um, in the prior two talks are important to to both the chemistry and the biota of the ocean for several reasons. So just as sort of background thinking about this. Um, first, there's um, solubility of the gases like CO2 and oxygen decreases with increasing temperature, so warm water holds less gas. Um, and then uh, physically, the stratification of the water column changes with temperature, which has alluded to in the first talk, um, the, where the, you saw the, the depth of the blob and the temperature influences in the North Pacific. So that stratification alters um, the vertical exchange of nutrients, oxygen, and carbon throughout the water column. And then um, finally, temperature is important for biota because it defines various habitats, cues reproduction, influences metabolism, life cycles, and behavior of various organisms. Um, so uh, just to start with for, for talking about the various um, ways that carbon can be influenced by um, and the pumps in the ocean. Um, so this slide just basically refers to the chemical and physical processes that, that control the variability of uh, of the biogeochemical cycling and uh, specific to carbon in the ocean. So you can see on, on the left the chemical and physical processes, um, the solubility that I was talking about, which is affected by temperature. And then there's, of course, the biological pumps. Um, and so I'm going to refer to those both when we get into the coastal communities. So first, to start with the open ocean response, um, the PMEL group, uh, NOAA's PMEL uh, carbon group, led by Dick Feely, has been um, monitoring carbon in, in the North Pacific via container ships, specifically PCO2, since uh, the early 80s. And so they have a long-term record. You can see the map. Um, you can see this map over here detailing this repeat, um, repeatedly occupied by a container ship, a ship of opportunity, um, where they've been monitoring PCO2. And that transect ended up um, crossing through the anomalously warm water that's been discussed in the last two, uh, the last two presentations associated with this marine heat wave, and so this is a record from that, those repeats in the occupied um, transects, showing the uh, 2014 um, transects here in these warm in the purple colors relative to 10 years prior in 2004, um, and then you can see the decadal trends um, highlighted. Uh, in the red, so those are sort of the averages. And this region that's uh, that's in the box is the region that you know that intersected an anomalously warm water. And what you notice is that there's more, there's higher PCO2 in the surface of the blob associated with that temperature, and so much so that in a um, a poster which is you know work in prep now for a paper by uh, Kathy Koska et al. in 2016, Ocean Sciences, um, they went so far as to say that this change could alter the region in terms of whether or not it was a source or sink for CO2, so making it a source um, for however long this anomaly will persist. Um, and because CO2 takes a long time to equilibrate with the atmosphere, that anomaly biogeochemically could persist longer than the temperature anomaly at the surface. Um, so the impacts of that remain, remain to be quantified. The coastal response is a little bit different. Um, in that, and now we're talking about much smaller scales than the, the prior two talks. Um, once we get in near the, near the coast, um, the, the the Ekman layers and the the, two, the upwelling circulation kept those warm waters offshore in 2014 longer than th so the longer than um, that so the temperature signal was not seen at the, um, in the coastal communities until later than it was offshore. Um, and so right around, so there, because there's such good monitoring offshore um, on the coast, you can see that they actually can get a time, um, a timing of when that um, upwelling circulation was not able to maintain and keep that the um, anomalously warm water offshore anymore. And so you can see at this um, location, this moored location off the coast of Washington, which happens to be the, the Chaba mooring, when that warm water um, arrived at, uh, in late September of, of 2014. And then also in Cal Coffee, this is a cross-section from line 80, so in Southern California, showing the normalized temperature anomaly from 2014 through 2015. So again, that subsurface 
So um, the stratification, there were major stratification changes in this upwelling zone, which um, most likely changed the nature of the upwelling. And um, those upwelling processes affect both coastal, um, the, are affect both oxygen and carbon. So that water that upwells from offshore has a particular signature of um, from of open ocean biogeochemistry that may have been altered um, with with this anomalous event. Okay, so what did the coastal records and monitoring for carbon show? What ha that happened? So here is a um, uh, the over over uh, over time from 2006 through 2015, the PCO2 record at um, at one mooring location um, the, off the Washington coast called Cape Elizabeth, um, and so this data is available at on PMEL's website, and you can download it from CDAC. The gray dots show you the um, record from 2006 through 2013. Uh, and 2014 is in pink and, and 2015 is in black here. So the blob again came in on, uh, into the area and started influencing in September of 2014. And so what you can see there is that the, um, that the pink record from 2014 was much lower than even the most recent, um, over than the past 10 years of PCO2 in that area, so I'm very much so on the low end of things. So that um, is different than what happened in the open ocean, right? The open ocean signal was much higher in response to these warm anomalous waters. And in this coastal region, the PCO2 was lower in the fall than it had been. And that um, pattern persisted through, through the, and influenced um, the onset of upwelling in the spring conditions of the following year. So this is also, again, black, um, from the beginning of 2015, spring of 2015, the, that upwelled water, um, you know, or preconditioned water for upwelling was also remained low. Um, so as near the, in the middle of the upwelling season of 2015, um, the PCO2 became within sort of normal range again, uh, but wasn't, wasn't high or, or particularly low, but on the lower end of the range. Um, up in the Gulf of Alaska, the signal is consistent with the, the PCO2 trend, which was also seen up there, which I'm not showing here, but um, the observations exist for that as well. You, we saw that the, um, there were less corrosive conditions found in the Gulf of Alaska. So what I'm showing here is um, a uh, depth profile, so there's depth here, versus the aragonite saturation state um, at a deep a deep profile from the uh, Seward line, which is which regularly monitors um, conditions in the Gulf of Alaska at this location. The red dots are for 2015, um, and then the prior years are are all grouped much lower than that. So um, they and that those red dots you can see extend pretty far um, down deep. So this was not just a surface signal, um, although it was greatest, uh, you know, there's a great difference between what happened before and, and now in, um, now in the, uh, in during the blob. Um, so the conditions were less corrosive than they had been in the past in response to the blob in the Gulf of Alaska. This is, um, and again, consistent with the PC, consistent with the PCO2 story in the coastal waters. Um, and then for oxygen, the story is also sort of similar to that, as you can I expect. So this is a figure taken from the um, West Coast Ocean Acidification uh, Panel recommendations for monitoring, showing um, existing and future monitoring sites for ocean acidification and hypoxia. So some of these assets are already on there. Um, this particular record is from uh, Cape Elizabeth, um, the OCMS. Um, the marine sanctuary moorings, and then this one is from the Humboldt, Humboldt um, State Trinidad headline, and um, and then here these are both from Cal Coffee. Um, this is the coastal north and, and coastal south, um, and so what happened all across these is that you can tell is that that the oxygen was higher than it has been 
over over prior intervals. So the gray indicates, um, you know, 10 years of recent past or so, and then the black on the top two is um, the black one is 2014. Um, this one is the grayer, the open circle ones is 2014, and then um, 2015 in purple and 2015 in black. You, you can see that oxygen was higher, especially in uh, 2015, than it has been. Um, than it has been in, in recent years. And the same is true in California, in the um, in Cal Coffee region, is that uh, the oxygen signal was higher, bottom oxygen. So that is all actually less stressful conditions for uh, organisms um, because it was less corrosive, um, PCO2 wasn't as high, and oxygen was higher. So what happened with um, with biota? So what you can see here is uh, uh, from the Cal Coffee report, um, Andrew Leasing was the lead on that. 2015, which is available online, you can you can download it. Um, you can see three panels of chlorophyll anomaly from the California Current System. Uh, 2014 was fairly low. 2015 um, as a whole was high, and July was anomalously low. Um, and of course, um, so something happened in between 2014 and 2015 in order to generate a really um, an anomalously high bloom. And um, that is uh, that was all what that anomalously high, high bloom was also um, full of toxic algae. This is one of the largest harmful algal blooms that we've experienced. Um, and so this uh, is a figure from um, Rafe Cudella and Vera Trainer. That's from their unpublished data that you can download this from uh, um, Coastal Science at NOAA's website about West Coast harmful algal bloom impacts. And what it basically shows was that demoic acid was detected in marine life um, from the Pacific Northwest all the way down to Southern California, and the harmful algal bloom extended all the way up into the Gulf of Alaska um, in the summer of 2015. And so the various organisms that where demoic acid was, was ob observed are depicted as cartoons here, um, and then geographically where they were observed on the map. And then uh, the toxic level is indicated by the color and then um, animals that experience seizures or observed to experience seizures um, have these halos around them, as you can see down here. So that um, the this harmful algal bloom response is definitely one that is being um, the influence of these of the warm anomaly is, is being uh, investigated and thought to be a, is a potential cause for. Um, so in addition, Bill Peterson's been making. Uh, observations of um, of copepod communities off of Newport for um, quite some time. This record goes back to 1996, and so he's um, work, been working on this copepod species richness in anomaly. And what you can see from this plot, which is in, um, an article from the Pisces newsletter from that Bill Peterson published this year, um, is that the copepod species richness index for the 2015 was the highest it's been. Um, in, you know, anecdotally in his article, he also says that there's there were species that he found that he has never seen before. Um, so it's certainly an anomalous event for the ecosystem as well. I think Jennifer Fisher's on the line, so she can probably help answer some questions about that during the question and answer if Bill didn't make it. Um, also, what um, sadly there was an unprecedented mass mortality event for auklets along along the coast. So this is um, work that Julia Parrish is working on and a slide that is online. You can check out presentations from the um, Pacific Anomalies Workshop, the second one, which happened up here in Seattle earlier in um, earlier in the year. And the slides are available on online, so you can check them out. This is one of the slides from Julie Keach's presentation. Um, it's worked by Julia Par Parrish. And what you can just see is that the 2014 to 2015 mean um, was much, much larger mortality than what the long-term average is. The size of the circles um, is, is proportional to the, um, to the number. Um, and one idea that um, Bill Peterson put into one of his articles, again, um, from the Pisces newsletters that I cite in the newsletter from Variations, is um, that the stratification uh, altered the upwelling such that the zooplankton communities were deeper than the auklets were able to get to um, in the 
the, in the way that they dive and feed um, along, the west, along the west coast. Um, there was also a decline in the pelagic fish forage population. So again, you can check out the California, State of the California Current Report and see like anchovies, mackerel, sardine abundances along, along these transects and how uh, there were some in 2013. Um, there's a lot of variability in prior years, but that in 2015 there were essentially no eggs found. And, and then finally, there were some biogeographic anomalies in that there were some warm water species, it's hard not to talk about these, that were found all the way up into the Gulf of Alaska. And this just details some uh, sunfish and some tuna that had never been seen up that far and a shark. Um, so some biogeographic changes as well. So in conclusion, the blob had major effects just beyond temperature. Um, the open ocean response differed from the coastal ocean response and mechanistically that has still has to be worked out. But um, the blob could have altered a region in the central Pacific from a sink to a source of carbon for the atmosphere. Um, the, the blob brought warm, high oxygen, low carbon water to the coastal regions of the PCS and Gulf of Alaska, possibly by changing the upwelling source water or influencing uh, winter mixing with the winter prior. Um, those mechanisms still have to be worked out. The ecosystem shifted northward and the harmful algal bloom dominated a massive phytoplankton bloom along the CCS. And the lasting impacts of that are still are being observed and determined. Um, so thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Samantha. Um, and thank you to all three presentations. We would now open it up for Q&A. You can either ask your questions via chat, which I'll read around, or you are more than welcome to raise your hand and, and I will try to take you off mute. So I do know that we have a couple questions that's come in, so I'm going to go ahead and get started with those. And if you have a specific question for a speaker, please make sure that you address it towards them. Um, if it's open to all three, that's fine as well. So Mike Jaycock writes for Menu. Menu, I think you're off mute. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay, Menu, Mike writes, um, while the NPGO and the PDO have become more strongly correlated, the correlations of each of them with INSO, the ONI for example, have remained constant. Given that INSO is the link between the PDO and NPGO, why, is it, why isn't it also becoming more strongly coupled to them? Okay, thanks Mike for your question. Um, we have to be careful uh, using NPGO and PDO as, as the indices for, for this type of dynamics that goes from the activation of radiano modes and into a PDO-like expression. So <clears throat> the, the NPGO is not the perfect index for meridional modes. So one better, uh, if, we, if we go back to this other uh, study here by Wang, uh, this is the study by Wang where they actually, um, let's see, where they were looking, in fact, at the link between this type of expression of SSD, which is related really to an atmospheric forcing, this uh, North Pacific Oscillation, or NPO. This particular link from here to here through presumably meridional modes, there seems to be actually in the observation also an increase in that coupling. So this is consistent with the increase in coupling that you have in the following winter between, you know, the, between this, NPGO-like expression and PDO-like expression. So really the key here is to examine if this connectivity, if these meridional modes are really intensifying, that, that is really the link to, to verify the extent to which this intensification of coupling is really related to this process. But uh, you cannot just uh, uh, quantify that by just taking one single measure of ENSO and trying to look at the running correlation. I, I don't know if it makes sense. <laughs> And let's Anyone? go into, I think Dylan had a question for you, Manu, um, following up on that, we'll stick with this topic. What was the simultaneous correlation between MPGO, PDO? Is there a trend in that? I, I personally, uh, the, 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 there is a correlation between PDO and MPGO in the recent, uh, in the last 20 years. This has is, is, is been reported, uh, and that's because you know, they're not really defined exactly to be independent because they're defined as different modes. Uh, one of the reasons why that correlation is probably getting stronger is because this wintertime variability coupling between these two types of pattern, which are dominant North Pacific, is becoming stronger. But, um, but I wouldn't, I think it's important to, to keep in mind that these are just statistical indices. So we, we may want to 
think of this really in the context of, of the forcing and response you know, of the atmosphere and the ocean and this type of kind of uh, where this PDO and PGO are really just kind of placeholders for these type of dynamics rather than perfect, uh, you know, uh, measures of, of those dynamics. Um, so, yes, you know, in the last uh, 20 years, the, the, the correlation between PDO and PGO went up, but I think this only reflects the fact that this kind of coupling and these type of mechanisms is becoming stronger. And so when you start looking at the more low frequency time scale, then, you know, you get some correlation. Thanks, Manu. And we have an interesting question here. I'm going to open it up to all three panelists because I'm not sure which one of you have worked on this. Um, Bob Stone wants to ask, uh, what influence did the Bob have on the Arctic? Um, he says the inland Alaska temperature regime and snow cycles and sea ice north of Alaska in 2015 through spring of 2016. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not aware of uh, I'm not aware of any literature that has looked at that just yet. Uh, I know that we talked at the Pacific Anomalies Workshop too in Seattle. We briefly talked about the possibility of our, the Arctic sea ice loss having an influence on on driving the blob and maybe having a hand in, in the ridge. But I, I'm not aware of any literature that's looked at the blob's influence on on Alaska temperature regimes or snow cycles. Manu, do you have any any ideas? No, no, I haven't looked at it uh, myself, so um, I, I'm not going to be able to comment. I'll just add that the um, the Seward line did observe, you know, fresher and warmer conditions um, in, during the 2015. Well, that's an interesting question, and we do have a working group, and I see Jennifer Francis is on here, so I definitely think there's probably interest in this group of looking at this topic as well. Okay, any other questions we have? We have a few more minutes left. <laughs> 